Good morning, Jillian and Jonathan. Uh, so we're going to continue here talking about the Reagan administration, and we're going to focus in this lecture on some international issues that were key during this period. Um, now, one of the things, we're in the Cold War still, very much the Cold War. In fact, it's fair to say the Cold War heated up in the early Reagan administration. Remember I mentioned the shoot down of the Korean airliner that had Americans on it. Um, but it's fair to say the Soviet Union was also very much involved in fostering what they would call wars of national liberation around the world. Um, they were sending weapons, they were sending money, and in some cases even military advisors to left-wing groups all over the planet. Um, and some of that happened in our own backyard. Uh, in 1979, so this is a year and a half before Ronald Reagan became president, while Jimmy Carter was still our president. In 1979, a group of left-wing rebels in Nicaragua, now that's in Central America, a group of left-wing rebels in Nicaragua overthrew the longtime dictator there, Anastasio Somoza, had been the dictator there for decades. Somoza had been an American client. Um... How shall I put this? In a lot of portion, in many portions of Latin America, there were dictators in power for long periods of time, and most American administrations thought that wasn't necessarily a bad thing. Uh, we'd like to think we always stand up for liberty, but sometimes when we were facing the Cold War, especially having a strong hand who was anti-communist in charge of a country suited us better than a democratic election that might elect a government that was more friendly to uh, the Soviet Union. And um, there were dictators around the world we propped up, uh, strongmen we propped up because they were anti-communist. The Shah in Iran, I mentioned, remember the Iranians overthrew the Shah? They hated America because America had backed the Shah. And we did it largely because he was anti-communist and pro-American. And Anastasia Somoza had been anti-communist and pro-American. Well, uh, and so we backed him, even though he was a dictator, military dictator. Um, well, the Sandinistas were left-wing rebels. They wanted to establish a socialist state in Nicaragua after they overthrew Somoza. And they had gotten weapons from the Soviet Union. Left-wing rebels all over the world did. And in 1979, they, they succeeded in winning the battle. They drove him from power and seized control in Nicaragua. Well, the Reagan administration, when he came into office, saw them essentially as Soviet puppets. Now, they definitely had gotten assistance from the Soviet Union. And Mr. Reagan was very concerned, perhaps with good reason, that they were going to be allowing the Soviets to build a submarine base in Nicaragua. So I was thinking about the Soviet Navy's submarines based, you know, just less than a thousand miles from the coast of Texas. Uh, this was very disturbing. And so while there were laws in place that kept the United States from directly intervening militarily in Nicaragua, uh, Mr. Reagan decided to start funding anti-Sandinista rebels. Um, these groups were called the Contras, those who were against the Sandinistas. They weren't necessarily united in a political ideology. They weren't necessarily standing for mom and apple pie, but they did oppose, Anastas they did oppose the Sandinistas, the, the pro-Soviet Sandinistas. So we gave them weapons, we gave them money. Uh, now eventually, out of fear that um, the United States will get dragged into another Vietnam-style war in Nicaragua. Congress would pass the Boland Amendment, which forbade direct aid to the Contras. Um, that's going to get Mr. Reagan's administration in a great deal of trouble later on, because not everybody in the administration is going to be on board with not helping the Contras. And even though it's illegal, there will be some aid given to the Contras. We'll talk more about the Iran-Contra scandal, which happened late in Mr. Reagan's time in office. But the fact that we were funding and assisting anti-socialist rebels in Nicaragua, 
was you know, one important overseas effort of the Reagan administration. Right next door to Nicaragua is Costa Rica, uh, sorry, El Salvador, El Salvador in Central America. And El Salvador had, again, a conservative government, um, not necessarily fully democratic, but pro-American, anti-Soviet. And there again, yet another example, there was the, I believe they were called the FMLN um, rebels, these left-wing rebels against a pro-American, not necessarily 100% um, uh, um, democratic government in El Salvador and American weapons and American advisors, just like Vietnam, American advisors went into El Salvador to help uh, the conservative, the right-wing government uh, over to drive back these left-wing rebels. The Soviets were backing the left-wing rebels. So we have yet another proxy civil war in El Salvador, and Americans were deeply involved in that. Uh, officers of the El Salvadorian army came to the United States, came to Texas actually, for training, and later on, some of them were proven to be leading death squads, assassinating peasants out in the countryside who were thought to be too pro-socialist. So, you know, Nicaragua, El Salvador, uh, these this Cold War playing itself out in proxy rebel versus government wars, Soviets and us from both sides, uh, very much part of the Reagan administration era uh, in foreign policy. In the Middle East, there were also uh, important uh, issues going on. In 1982, Israel invaded Lebanon. Now, there were pro-Iranian militias, Hezbollah it's called, in southern Lebanon who were launching attacks against Israel um, from their territory. Lebanon's right north of Israel. Israel, Lebanon, north of it, right? And Hezbollah was launching rockets and the like into Israel uh, from southern Lebanon. 1982, the Israelis sent their army into southern Lebanon. They seized these Hezbollah territories militarily. This destabilized the Lebanese government, and the Lebanese government collapsed into a civil war mess. In 1983, a temporary peace was negotiated between the various warring factions in Lebanon, and peacekeeping troops were supposed to go in to guarantee this peace. And the United States sent hundreds of U.S. Marines into Lebanon to try to be guarantors of peace. Sadly, on October 23, 1983, a suicide bomber drove a truck full of explosives under into a parking garage under the barracks where the Marines were staying, <coughs> and more than 200 U.S. Marines were killed. This uh, was the first time Middle Eastern terrorists had killed large numbers of Americans. And from then on, the rest of the Reagan administration, and really till this day, Americans have been a target of Muslim extremist violence that originates in the Mideast. Now, in 9-11, they brought it here to the United States, but... Really, it all boils down to the United States is America's, sorry, the United States is Israel's strongest supporter on earth, by far, by far. And many Muslims consider Israel's very existence to be an affront to them. Those lands they feel were Arab Muslim lands that were stolen by the Jews to create Israel in 1947. And to this day, they deeply resent Israel's existence. Many of them do and would like to destroy it. And since America is, is Israel's biggest backer, we supply overwhelmingly their military, um, and a great deal of aid goes from the United States to Israel every year to help them stay strong, to protect themselves. Um, this, this was a case of spillover. We were seen as pro-Israeli, and uh, the people who attacked our Marines were attacking them for that reason, and killed more than 200 on one, in one explosion. And since then, our bases overseas, our ships at, in the ports, our embassies, uh, and of course 9-11 here at home, um, Americans have been targets. And so this in some ways was the beginning of a very nasty business that came along. Okay, so those, those are 
that's a quick thumbnail when you add the Cold War tensions uh, with the Soviets more directly. I was talking about the tensions over the strategic defense initiative, Star Wars. When you, when you look at the proxy wars being fought in Central America, you look at our involvement in the Middle East and so on. That, that's a pretty good portrait of the first term Ronald Reagan was in office. So that's January 81 to January 85. Ronald Reagan ran for uh, president re-election in 1984. His opponent was Walter Mondale. Walter Mondale had been vice president under Jimmy Carter. He was a, a senior senator from Minnesota before becoming vice president. And he was the Democratic nominee against Ronald Reagan, the Republican nominee in 1984. And Reagan trounced uh, Mondale. I believe that only Minnesota and Massachusetts voted for Walter Mondale and Reagan got all the other electoral votes. Um, just to give you an example, I know the precinct I live in here in Bedford voted, I think it was 94% for Ronald Reagan in 1984. Uh, it was a landslide election. Uh, maybe the greatest landslide in American electoral history. I'm not certain about that. Certainly in modern times. Um, and if I can find a way to screen it for you, I just don't know how. Um, maybe I'll try to find it and put it in the next video at the beginning. One of the classic campaign ads of all time, the Morning in America ad, ran in 1984 for Ronald Reagan. And so if you're a student at all of politics and that sort of thing, uh, you really want to uh, uh, have a look at that. So I'll see if I can find a way to do that in the next one. Um, the... Uh, yeah, the, the, uh, the Electoral College, uh, 525 electoral votes for Reagan, 13 for Walter Mondale. Um, no, Mondale won only his home state of Minnesota and the District of Columbia. So even Massachusetts, even very liberal Massachusetts voted for Ronald Reagan in 1984. It was an overwhelming landslide. Um, the shrinking of the federal government had been a priority of the first administration. And uh, the federal government, outside of the Defense Department, had shrunk some. Not nearly as much as people might have thought, but really the election turned more on a vastly improved economy. The economy was beginning to roar. Part of the reason it was roaring was lots of money being spent on defense. And when you think about it, defense spending does prime much of the economy. Uh, you know, to make a fighter plane, think about all the parts, all the people employed all over the country in producing things that go into a single fighter plane. Uh, it's not just the company that puts it together at the end, but there are suppliers from all over the United States who also get a piece of the pie when defense spending dollars are spent. Not to mention the number of people employed by the military as military personnel and civilians is quite large and it grew in this period. So unemployment dropped the economy started to boom along quite nicely. And after the doldrums and the economic doldrums of the 1970s, this was a very welcome change. There was a real spirit of optimism uh, by 1984. And that's what the Morning in America ad captures, that Ronald Reagan played, he was very much an embodiment of this optimistic spirit, this America can do it. Uh, my, my advice to you is when you're looking at presidential campaigns, if under most conditions, there can be exceptions. Under most conditions, the most optimistic, positive sounding candidate usually prevails in American politics. That's so my observation, is if you look at the demeanor, the ads, the ones who say America can do it, we can get there, uh, we have a great vision of the future and how we're gonna change it for the better, um, that usually is the winning ticket in America. Americans are optimistic people. We're not, we're not downer people. <laughs> and so if, if you see a candidate who's always just bad mouthing everything and has got no sense that we can really do this, I think they tend to lose. We'll see. I mean, just keep that in mind as you go out to your life and see if I'm right about that. Okay, I'll be back with another lecture soon. God bless.